At the best of times, family life is not so much like this. Can anyone recognize the family on the top right? The Waltons, the idyllic family of the 70s. Hollywood's dream, when all multiple generations were living under the same roof in perfect harmony, grandparents, grandchildren living together. Um, nor is it a bed of roses. There's a bed of roses for you in a nice heart shape. So family life is not like that. It's more like this. It's a bit more like finger pointing, covering your ears, not wanting to know difficult people. Even an infant, even a child has to inoculate themselves from the stress imposed by, by parents. So family life can be fraught. And um, there are so many struggles. But difficult isn't always impossible. Sometimes you win. A lot of times you learn. And a lot of times you grow and develop. I like the slide on, the, on, on my uh, right uh, for challenge. So I suppose sometimes when we come across a challenge, we can tend to knock our heads against a brick wall and get very, very frustrated in that process. But isn't it great to, be, to overcome a challenge, to glide over a challenge, or get around a challenge? And I don't know if you can see the, the slide saying five expectations to let go. Because when we think about family life, sometimes we have impossibly high expectations of our parents. We're very critical of our parents. We really are very raw and blunt in our judgment of our parents. So expectations to let go would be, well, having perfectly behaved kids. Does that ever happen? Not really. Husband can read my mind. Would be wonderful. Or wife. A spotless and organized home. That will cost you a lot of money. It can be done. Or the ability to lose the last 10 pounds and there will be nirvana. You will have arrived when that last 10 pounds is gone. And everyone should like me. So you can see that sometimes we set ourselves up for failure and distress and more struggles and more uh, problems because we have very high expectations and we need, really need to manage and check in on those expectations from time to time. So what are the typical family reactions in the face of any illness, particularly sometimes psychological and emotional distress? Well, sadness, even depression in carers, in the caregivers or supporters. Anger towards the person. Uh, and that can be particularly peculiar to mental health difficulties where by someone's behavior may change or their demeanor may change and the person may get a bit of blame for that or professionals may get a bit of blame for that and we understand that that anger can be projected onto professionals who may be the bearer of bad tidings about a diagnosis that may be unfortunately around for a long time guilt did i pass on the illness gene or anxiety in terms of thinking about the future of the person with uh, psychological problems. What about their career? What about their relationships? Will they succeed in any of those very important life arenas? Um, what about um, the future risk? And is there a concern about self-harm or suicide? There's so much discussion about that in the media nowadays. And there can be, frankly, a sense of paralysis in the face of new terminology, treatments, medication, therapy, really a jargon and a language that people have to really feel their way with um, because it can really be uh, terrifying. And there, be, there may be most of all an altered perception of the person. The person may seem to be different. They may have morphed into, into an illness. And obviously illness is not an identity. It should never be an identity. It's a problem you have to manage, but it can be very hard to find the person that you once know and loved in the midst of this illness. But having said that, most can learn the main elements of the caring role, but not perfectly, but not perfectly. So to summarize, I suppose, loss of expected future of the person with mental illness, um, that's a big concern. Worry about suicide and aggressive behavior, perhaps. Concern about underactivity or underachievement in many areas of uh, one's functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Mental illness, remember, exists whereby I suppose the symptoms are so pervasive or so severe that your day-to-day -day function is affected in a number of different arenas. And there is certainly a big need for information that family members, caregivers have when they, when they first uh, come up against an illness. There is a big, big rush for information, a, a big angst about it, about the condition, about its treatment, and, and about its implications for the future. So very often, relatives and family members are very, very willing to engage in a crisis with professionals, particularly at the onset of illness in our experience. People are looking for information, uh, above all, and reassurance on whether family actions or neglect has caused uh, the disorder. And very often that isn't the case. 
And very often, unfortunately, sometimes professionals get very caught up in that. And uh, there are various theories of, of different illnesses. I'm thinking of schizophrenia, for example. When people do, and theorists and researchers point to a faulty emotional connection between parents and kids, and I've almost blamed parents. And I think that's been quite wrong. Um, in terms of understanding the, the etiology of certain types of ma major mental illness. So in most cases, that's not the case. Now, there may be very clear cases where a direct trauma or an abusive experience was perpetrated by parents, uh, and that may be very clear cut. But in most cases, I think we can say no. Family members will want expert advice about welfare benefits or entitlements because dealing with Department of Social Protection is, a, is like being in a scrum, isn't it? It's, it's pretty much lock, locking horns through an immovable bureaucracy. You know, basic entitlements that people would have imagined as taxpayers they're entitled to uh, can be really, really difficult. It can be like extracting teeth, unfortunately. Um, people are looking for knowledge and information about the effects of, on the mental health of other family members living and managing and uh, caring for someone who has depression or any other form of distress. Need for periods of respite, well, that's something that does come a lot from uh, my subspecialty, which is the psychiatry of later life, because this idea, particularly if someone is looking after someone with an organic mental disorder or dementia, it's a very useful uh, service uh, by the health services that periods of respite uh, are, are offered. Now, that can be really, really useful. It does allow carers for example, of people with dementia, to have a break, which can allow them to continue the, the, the caregiving role. But that really does not exist outside the, the category of dementia, unfortunately, uh, even though it can serve uh, a great purpose, whereby the person, the, fa the person gets a respite from the family and vice versa, the family gets a respite from the person. That doesn't mean that there isn't a close emotional connection. That doesn't mean that people don't want to go on caring. But sometimes periods of respite can be helpful. But family members often ask questions like, what will happen in future when I die, when the family person passes on? Who will do the care at that stage? Whose responsibility will it be? So genetic factors and depression. It's amazing how often I'm asked this. And I work in uh, the psychiatry of later life. But, but for an adult psychiatrist, I'm sure it comes up uh, very frequently. And I would want to say, first of all, that depression is not inherited through a single gene. Depression is not a genetic condition. It is not that simple. It is not that complex. However, people may inherit a vulnerability. And often, it's an interaction between genes and the environment that may produce problems. Life stresses can trigger depressive episodes in those who may be vulnerable. So just to show you how inexact this, this the, the estimate, if you like, of the genetic contribution of depression is in the range of 20 to 45%. Basically, we don't know. And we have to be honest about that. And certainly, the more you move away from bipolar disorder, the more you move towards a clinical picture of a reactive depression or a depression induced by a particular stress or setback, the less important is the genetic component. So understanding the illness, I think, I think we can say safely and without contradiction, many loved ones have a hard time understanding depression. And I want to share with you a quote from Williams, William Styron, which really illustrates this. Depression is a disorder of mood, so mysteriously painful and elusive as to verge close to being beyond description. It thus remains nearly incomprehensible to those who have not experienced it in its extreme mode. So that's how difficult it is. As a rule of thumb, you can never underestimate how serious depression can be for the, for, for the person experiencing it. It can affect even the most basic functioning. It can be all pervasive, uh, affecting every domain and aspect of their lives. Your depressed loved one can't just snap out of it. Depression drains away optimism and energy. And far from it that they're not trying, actually people who are experiencing depression are trying harder than most. The symptoms of depression also are not personal. We know that depression makes emotional connection very difficult. It makes it hard to connect with others, and hurtful things may be said on both sides due to anxiety, uh, anger, and frustration. Some family members may do the damnedest just to deny the problem or hide it, uh, but that won't make the, the, the problem go away. You can't fix someone else's depression, uh, but what can you do? Well, if your friend or family member is depressed, I suppose that's the first question uh, you would want to ask. You've got to be maybe familiar with the signs, which we'll turn to in a moment. Notice the problem, basically, and encourage help seeking. That's the broadly uh, acceptable stance that I think we want to nurture and encourage. 
certainly be concerned, and we will talk about risk, be concerned if your loved one has lost hope or withdrawn from others or talks of self-harm. And we'll talk in a little bit more detail about those red flags that people really should be aware of. Without being on a permanent state of alarm or being in a permanent crisis about this. So just to share with you the signs of depression, people will be familiar with this list, but in addition to lethargy, which is top of the list, I want to mention, I suppose, pervasive sadness or a subjective lowering of mood. And thirdly, as a core criterion, uh, there is anhedonia, a lo- or loss of pleasure in previously pleasurable activities. Now, if you have two of those three top criteria, along with associated features, then you have a diagnosis of what's called clinical depression or major depression, usually which is lasting, hanging around for two weeks or longer. can be much longer, obviously. And symptoms that we would typically associate with depression would be trouble sleeping, trouble concentrating, apathy, the sadness that we talked about, irritability. Sometimes irritability can be a key feature of depression, very often in us men. Feelings of worthlessness or detachment from friends, social avoidance, which only makes the depression worse. Uh, Changes in appetite and weight can be increased, can be decreased. Uh, Low sex drive, pain, Depression, you know, exacerbates any sense of pain that a a person may have. If you have a bad disc, the pain from that area in your back may be magnified hugely. Any pain, literally from the top of your head to the tip of your toe. Recklessness, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, even prescription abuse or over-the-counter medication abuse, and suicidal tendencies. So I want to turn now to really... Uh, talk about how you encourage a person experiencing depression to get help. How do we actually get to to the point where we can get an assessment done, know exactly what type of condition we're dealing with, and thereafter hopefully a management plan can follow? Well, we have to acknowledge that getting a person into with depression, experiencing depression, into treatment can be very difficult. It can be really challenging. Uh, You may have to be very persuasive. You may have to take it one small step at a time with small goals, offering support all the time, encouraging the person to draw on that support and recognising the problem. And even if they're in the throes of a very severe depression, making some positive choices each day. So the choice could be I could stay in bed or the choice could be I could try and go down, get up, Uh, do the basics, shower, shave, or whatever needs to be done, maybe go down to the shops. At least there is some human contact. You'll have less of a slope to climb if you keep some activities going. So positive choices each day. Suggesting a a checkup or a chat with the GP may be far less threatening than going to someone like myself, a shrink, or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. But if someone is willing to go to a mental health professional, offer to help find them one. That can be quite trying, um, and you may have to uh, approach a number of people. You may have to get recommendations from a GP. You may have to um, go on the Internet. You may have to make a lot of calls to check availability and so on. Accompanying someone to the first visit can really offer great moral support, so that's highly recommended, even if you're not involved in the, the process, even if you're waiting at the door and to take them to for coffee after the assessment. That can be really, really practically helpful. Encourage a person to write down their concerns. Now, this may seem obvious, but when someone goes in to meet a doctor for the first time, if they don't know them, a lot of what they're worried about can actually just fly out of their head. So compile a list of symptoms or useful information. And if you are involved in the assessment process, offer your own observations if requested. That's why you will be invited in after all. How do you talk to a loved one about depression? Um, I suppose listening. You know, it's no coincidence that in terms of human communication, we have been designed with two ears and one mouth because, you know, the most sensitive form of communication is done by listening, is it not? And that's more important than maybe giving advice prematurely. Remember, giving advice prematurely may be perceived as criticism by the person with depression. So it has to be done sensitively, if at all. So encouraging discussion of his or her feelings and listening without judgment. You may need to have to have the same conversation repeatedly, echoing a sense of concern and demonstrating actively this receptiveness to to listen. An icebreaker would be, and again, I'm just giving you a standard phrase that you may want to put into your own terminology, your own language, your own parlance. Recently, I've noticed some differences in you, and I've wondered how you're doing. But again, that statement is pretty non-threatening, so that's really just what I want to illustrate. Other questions to ask would be, when did you begin feeling like this? Did something happen to you? How can I best support you? Have you thought about getting help? And above all, offer a sense of hope, 
and encouragement. Avoid jargon, avoid technical language. Uh, that may not be helpful. It may become, quite frankly, a barrier to communication. And things to say that may help. You're not alone in this. I'm here for you. You may not believe it right now, but the way you're feeling will change. This is temporary. I may not understand exactly how you feel, and I think that's being honest, as we've said earlier. You know, there is a bridge of understanding implicit uh, in, in depression in many cases. But I care about you, and I want to help. Above all, demonstrate your listening and encourage talking. Encourage talking all the time. That can be the best defense, I suppose, against this descent into the maelstrom of isolation and silence and negativity that depression can, can suck you into. I like the quote at the bottom. Depression is not a sign of weakness. It means you've been strong for far too long. Now, things to avoid saying, I suppose, be cautious about saying depression is all in your head or look on the bright side. What's wrong with you? You have so much to live for. Why do you want to die? Just think about that statement. Why do you want to die? If someone, say, is a parent and they're thinking about killing themselves, a statement like that will just compound the guilt that they may feel. Or I can't do anything about your situation. Or the famous one, just snap out of it. Or shouldn't you be better by now? Again, they're the things to avoid. But don't forget the silence or nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication may be the most accurate form of communication that we human beings convey, often very subconsciously. Uh, And again, as I've said, don't advise too early or change the subject. And if the person does want to change track a little bit, don't be afraid to describe your own feelings or respond to their humor and reminiscence. You know, some people may tap into their sense of pride and want to talk about the past or reminisce a little bit and go with that. Take the cues from the the person. So if you're then coming into the assessment and if you're dealing with a therapist, a doctor, a clinician, GP, call them what you will, someone who basically is sincere and wants to help. What information does that person need to know in terms of doing a really comprehensive assessment? Well, we call this collateral information. We, we gather collateral information. And a definition of that is basically the story retold by the outside observer. Now, for us mental health professionals who deal, we're, we're after all dealing with a verbal subject. We're dealing with information. We're trying to prioritize information. We're trying to gather information and assess it, it can be incredibly useful. This exercise is incredibly useful. It helps us order and reorder and prioritize the information which may already have been told by the, her- by the, the person in the history that they have given us. It can have therapeutic benefit, I would argue, if symptom pattern uh, is confirmed and very often in, in terms of uh, doctors anyway and GPs and psychiatrists, we are problem solvers. So often, you know, the 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 ball can be uh, got rolling of that problem-solving process, even in the midst of us gathering information from family members. And I suppose it's useful if the family can be interviewed alone. Now, obviously, we would generally ask the person, is that okay? Uh, Because that allows debriefing, and families do want to debrief. They simply want to come in and tell the story of how challenging and difficult and how much of an emotional roller coaster accompanying uh, accompanying the person with depression on on that journey has been. And subsequently, then, joint family patient meetings may be useful, again, if the patient gives consent. And and family members are usually very understanding that sometimes that consent may not be forthcoming immediately, and they will usually make allowance for that. But eventually, it usually is with time and when trust emerges in the treating relationship. So what information are we looking for in that assessment? And I suppose things that maybe you would want to maybe prompt the assessor regarding would be the course of symptoms, how the symptoms started, how they developed, how they got worse, did they get better when partial treatment was given or whatever. What was the progress otherwise of symptoms or difficulties or distress that the person had? Are they adhering to treatment? Or if they're not adhering to treatment, is that because of reasons of side effects, for example? What risky behaviours is someone concerned about, be it excess alcohol or over-the-counter medication use? Obviously, we will talk about suicide risk. We want to talk about someone's level of function uh, or recovery, if that is the case. In particular, we want to talk about a baseline level of function. How well did the person function before the onset of illness? Because that is the goal which we aim to get people back to. Are there family dynamics? Are there difficult relationships, difficult communications going on. If there are, that's something that the assessor, the clinician, will very much want to be aware of. And how is the family coping as a whole? 
Now, in terms of dealing with professionals, I just want to give you some hints because you may be prompting someone with depression to engage with the professional and I suppose I would say to you, try and develop good working relationships with a variety of sources, not just one person, because that one person does have to go away on holidays sometimes, or they're away, there may be a crisis, and really you have to have irons in a number of fires, I think, and, and forge as many links as possible. Uh, I'm thinking of GPs, and GPs are very practical, problem-solving people. Uh, CPN, that means community psychiatric nurse. If someone is under the HSE, that is a service that may be available. Or PHN, that means public health nurse. And PHNs are incredibly powerful people in the community. They are the gatekeeper of a lot of services, believe me. Psychiatrist, obviously, uh, but other multidisciplinary team members. Your the, the person with depression may be actually working quite closely with a psychologist or a social worker or an occupational therapist. So getting to know them can be uh, very important as well. Uh, and the team secretary, a vital person. Who gets by a secretary? No one gets by a secretary. So very important to have a good working relationship with them. And utilize as many ways as possible to communicate with the team. Now, having said that, the team may have a certain preference for the type of uh, information they look, they're looking for and the mode of information, the, the, the way it can be communicated. Sometimes it can be done through clinic visits, whereby the outpatient consultation may automatically involve a relative caregiver or whatever. Sometimes it's done by phone. Sometimes it's done by email, but bearing confidentiality uh, in mind. And sometimes I, I will receive unsolicited information. And I feel I'm ethically bound maybe to listen to that, but not give any information back. So I'm not jeopardizing uh, that sense of confidentiality. But obviously, if a, a patient says, do not talk to uh, uh, such and such a relative, we will absolutely adhere to that strictly, uh, again, to maintain confidentiality. And if you're dealing with a professional and you want to see them, decide what sort of a consultation do you need and be specific as possible. Have it in your own mind that you want to get something out of this. You want some objectives or goals or extra information about the illness or maybe you want to impart your concerns about the person or their progress or lack of progress. Uh, maybe you want to get information about additional services or maybe you're looking for personal support, something to do with your own mental health or your own stress levels so that you can sustain uh, the caregiving role. Now, health services are barraged with criticism at the moment, and particularly the HSE. It's become sometimes, I'm sorry to say, in a media-driven uh, culture, you know, a byword for incompetence and mismanagement and crisis and all sorts of things, money wasting and so on. Um, so morale is on the floor, uh, to be honest, uh, in most health services. So if things are going well, do let professionals know that they're going well. Now, when things aren't going well, when things are going wrong... Uh, think about it. Pause. If things aren't right, ask, are you angry with the illness or what you may justifiably perceive as poor care? But also we know that blaming uh, the bearer for bad news is common from time to time. And when you do have to complain, as you should and you have every right to do, voice complaints clearly and be very specific and try and not be personal. Uh, and try and ask for a prompt resolution or an improvement in care. I remember working for a consultant in the UK when I was training, and really, she was quite open. I could knock on her door at any time and say, Marissa, there's a problem on the ward. But then, as I got into the job, she actually stopped this knock on the door. It became less frequent, and I wondered why. And she said, look, if you are coming with a problem to me, bring me a menu of solutions. So I had to bring with her with me a menu of solutions to resolve the particular problem. And you may have an idea, a very clear idea, about how a problem can be fixed and do offer that solution. And I think the team will generally take that on board. Remember that putting your trust in the team, and we know that that has to be earned. You know, we know that that's not a given. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, as I say, health services may have a bad reputation. People may get a a raw deal. You know, people may get turned away when they're genuinely distressed and looking for help. So we have to earn that trust. But remember, if you do that and you are patient with the treatment process, that can set a very good example in forbearance for the person with the illness, because sometimes the recovery may be quite prolonged, it may be stop-start, and it may need a lot of forbearance. So supporting the depression treatment process, being patient and compassionate is very helpful. This is not easy. I'm not saying stuff to you tonight that, that is easy, I'm afraid. It is very, very difficult. 
uh, unconditional support is the ideal, but who can offer that unconditional support? You know, we only get unconditional anything really from maybe our mothers in life, and thereafter we have to pretty much go out and earn it. But uh, that's the ideal. Uh, it's very challenging. Certainly basic assistance can be really helpful. Uh, basic assistance that's needed and that the person is willing to accept, for example, doing the shopping or walking the dog or practical day-to-day -day tasks that may be just beyond the person at this moment with depression in that phase of the illness. Have realistic expectations. Roll with the frustration of slow progress. Sometimes recovery can seem like two steps forward and one step backwards, and there can be a tendency to get a bit frustrated and demoralized, and that's understandable. Lead by example yourself. Lead what's known as a healthy, mood-boosting lifestyle. I love that phrase, a healthy, mood-boosting lifestyle. That may mean different things to different people, but in general terms, it may mean keeping a positive outlook, trying to rise above the crisis when it comes, or having a good diet, for example, and sharing maybe a good diet if you're living under the same roof with that person. A commitment to exercise, saying, I'm going out for a walk. Would you like to come along? They may not always, but they may on other occasions. And decreasing alcohol. You know, alcohol and depression are very bad bedfellows indeed. Uh, very, very bad. And, you know, it can be a real gesture, uh, an acknowledgement of the severity of someone's problem if you decide to have an alcohol-free household by mutual agreement. Encourage activity. Activity that's appropriate to the stage of recovery where the person is at. Cinema is wonderful. I, I'm a great fan of the cinema. And sometimes people go on day leave here to the cinema. And if you think about it, you're looking at a screen, you're looking straight ahead, side to side. There's no intensity. In fact, conversation is actually actively discouraged in the cinema for obvious reasons. So it can be very easy to do. It can be a very useful form of distraction for people who are actually going through depression. And remember, cinemas are generally open in the evenings and depression occasionally being a day of two halves, mood being better in the evening, a cinema may be a very useful distraction. Or a meal out. Or walking, walking and talking. Treading the stress into the ground as you're conversing can be very, very helpful. The phrase is, be, try and be lovingly persistent, difficult and all as this can be. Other practical support you can give, obviously hope, but would be a mood diary. You can encourage the person to fill in their mood, to make a graph of their mood. This can be really helpful when this is presented to the assessing clinician at the outpatient visit, to know when the mood is up, when it's down, what are the activities that linked in with that, are there any associations that the person will de with depression will actually notice. In other words, that their mood was better when they were you know, on holidays or when they were uh, doing more exercise or whatever. Consistency and reliability, I suppose, as a caregiver are probably the two most important principles of caring. But credibility also. Pitch in with chores, maybe even temporarily financial support. Uh, that can be really, really important. People who are, you know, unable to work, who have to take statutory sick pay, you know, may be at a severe financial disadvantage. So they may need help with the rent or bills temporarily. Uh, messages. Speaking with the person's boss. That can be a really useful gesture of support. Childminding, accompanying someone to hospital or visiting them in hospital or arranging the transport to accompany someone to hospital. But again, avoid excesses. Keep it reasonable. Largesse may spring from and induce guilt. And very often people who haven't been in the scene and want to kind of demonstrate a grand gesture of support, like a bunch of flowers every day of the week, it's not that much use, really, and uh, the person really isn't, mightn't be in a position they feel to return it. So keep it simple and sustain it. Uh, and only do what you can sustain, because otherwise you may face burnout. Specific support may focus around treatment, around medication, timing of medication, reminding about blood tests, because it's amazing how people will forget the importance, for example, of lithium blood tests, appointments, as I've said, or even the logistics of, of transport. So, tips for family and friends, the do's. To borrow the old uh, emergency metaphor from aviation, stay on track with your own life, fit your own oxygen mask first. Got to fit it on yourselves first before you can help anyone else. Look after your own needs, at least at a basic level, before you can uh, jump in there and help other people. You must have a certain amount of emotional spare capacity within yourselves to do that. And this triangular relationship, we call it, uh, with the patient and the professional, 
each corner of the triangle is very, very significant. And that's where often the best care can be delivered through, having a triangular relationship, not only with the, 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 the person with depression, for example, but also with their professional. Be aware of their pattern of depression. And although the symptoms of depression I've listed them earlier, are remarkably common and consistent across many people. Not, in, I should say, in the group of people I work with, with older people, they very often have atypical or unusual uh, uh, patterns of depression. But, you know, you may become familiar uh, with the person through observation uh, and, and no patterns, particularly the relapse signature. When is a relapse coming on? Is it around losing sleep for a week? Is that a, a major warning sign that needs to be acted on? Consider joining a care or support group. Give yourself permission to ventilate frustrations. Every close human relationship is, is underpinned with ambivalence. And that doesn't mean you're going to abandon the person, but there will be frustrations you want to offload. And what better group of people to do it with than people who understand exactly the hassles, the frustrations that you're going through. Learn about depression, perhaps. Maybe learn about the research. That helps you remain objective, realising that you are dealing with a very distinct condition. And respect the treatment choice of the person. You may not approve of medication. You may not approve of therapy. You may all consider it rubbish. Uh, but the person uh, who's going through the condition has the right to choose, in collaboration with their health professional, the mode of treatment that suits them best. And you've got to respect the, the, the treatment choice. Although you may often be the first line of defense against depression, as we've said, you can't fix the person. So other tricks of, of the do's would be give full attention. Listen, as we've said before. Validate the person's feelings. A statement like, I'd feel exactly the same way if that happened to me. That can be incredibly normalizing and affirming, particularly if people are having, for example, suicidal thoughts. And that's not in any way colluding with it as a solution, but you're just normalizing, validating, really understanding where the person is at. Offer encouragement, reminding the person of their qualities and achievements. Choosing the right time to do that. Because sometimes if someone is very, very profoundly depressed and you're trying to talk them up and talk them out of it, they may perceive that you're not on their page or that you're just trying to glide over their, their distress. No warning signs, as we've said above all, when help is needed and when to uh, put up the distress flare, make a phone call for help. Respect the person's choice about how much to share. People will want to share a lot with you, but not everything with you. Be available to discuss bigger decisions when called upon. Offer concrete help, as we've said. The practicals are really, really important to do. That keeps the ship afloat. Include the person, keep the relationship balanced, and expect good days and expect some bad days. And, and unfortunately, sometimes recovery and the journey of depression, particularly when relapse occurs, can be a mixture of the two. Now, in terms of the don'ts, don't think that everyone with depression is actively suicidal. There is a generation of concerned parents out there who fear that every time their kids are bullied or receive a, a bad text or something goes wrong, that their kid is going to harm themselves. And, and, you know, we know that youth suicide has received a, right, a rightful degree of, of attention in the media and scrutiny. But just because you have suicidal thoughts does, doesn't mean you are at imminent risk of actually ending your life. So you have to strike that balance, but also neither ignore the warning signs that someone is at risk. And what are those warning signs? I want to share a few with you. Those who maybe talk openly about suicide or death, certainly that can be a warning sign, particularly those who express hopelessness about the future. And indeed, that may be more predictive of completed suicide than even actual suicidal ideation itself. And in particular, those who withdraw, who disengage, who pull back from those close to them. That, again, can be quite a, a serious harbinger that something uh, you know, may be about to happen. People who act in dangerous ways or reckless ways, who set their affairs in order, who seek out means to harm themselves or experience a sudden period of calm after being very depressed. And that may be because, unfortunately, they may have decided to proceed with end ending their lives. And this can often induce a period of calm, which can be quite deceptive to family members and even professionals when, unfortunately, a tragedy happens. But again, always encourage contacting professional help. You can't be uh, left with this responsibility of really judging whether someone is at risk or not. You have to be backed up by uh, the professionals who should be willing to respond. Don't let the caring role become overwhelming. The person should and will usually take more and more responsibility for themselves as they recover. So you're not in this permanent groove of caring. People will 
uh, very often uh, want to do more for themselves as they, as they get better. So don't be judgmental. Don't compare the person's experience to others or trivialize or dismiss uh, their experiences. Don't automatically offer reassurance. Let the person say what's on their mind first. Otherwise, the person can feel dismissed or disappointed in having shared a confidence. And as we've said again, don't take things too personally. Irritability, quietness can unfortunately go with the depression territory. It can be part of that landscape. Now, if you're wondering about asking someone if they are feeling suicidal, and you're wondering, are you at risk of planting a thought into their mind? You're not. There's no evidence for that. And you can ask about suicidal thoughts directly in the confidence that you are not giving them ideas about that or endorsing that. I want to share a reference with you. And uh, the title of this slide is actually the title of a book, Walking Together Through Hard Times, 12 Steps for Caregivers and Receivers by Bledsoe and Bledsoe. And these authors came up with the 12-step template that I was talking about. They talk about steps 1 to 12. Step 1, tell your story, gain perspective, uh, patience and empathy. Uh, step 2 is face your fears and then take action. Step 3 is choose great role models. There may be people out there that you know who are pretty good instinctive carers and we should emulate them. We should join them. Uh, record stories of other caregivers. Acknowledge the psychological impact of it all and keep a positive attitude, step four. Pace yourself, prioritise, brainstorm difficult problems. Develop a good support system, step six. Step seven, call for help and care for those who provide it. What lessons have you learned in receiving help? And obviously, we're going to talk a lot about this in a moment. Take time for yourself. List the things that renew and refresh you and try and do them regularly. Offer help, step nine, but not too much. Maybe there's a balance. Maybe the person with depression, the care receiver, would like to do things for him or herself. Step 10, deal with your anger. What triggers it? How can it be dealt with? And the, get, the best thing to do is in the cool light of day, step away from any anger or frustration that you may feel and really find out what's behind it and try and divert it at source. Step 11, let go of your guilt. Step 12, affirm yourself. Count your blessings. Remind yourself that you're doing a fantastic job, a unique job, a privileged job, and remind yourself that you're doing it really, really well. I want to look at spousal tips. Uh, dealing um, with depression in a spouse can be very challenging. We have this idea, this pattern match in the movies of marital bliss forevermore, and an illness can really really, really knock that sideways, that expectation. Dealing with depression from the sidelines can certainly be almost as frustrating as experiencing it oneself. There is no doubt about that. The closer you are to the person with depression, the more you may feel this. But be engaged, be committed to the marriage. What the person may be looking for is a sense of emotional security. Be someone your spouse can trust. And of course, the icing on the marriage cake is catching your spouse doing something right and praising him for it. I put down him for it. Sorry about that. <laughs> and don't nag. I, I want to show this slide to my wife. Don't nag. Nagging reinforces bad behavior, a terrible idea, while ignoring it may well diminish it. That's wonderful. Praise good behavior and it increases. And I often think the real secret of good communication in a marriage is just letting the little annoyances go, letting them go, biting your tongue once in a while. Okay, this idea of a spotter. Um, in some conditions, in bipolar mood disorders, we'll see this is a very, very important concept. And what is a spotter? A spotter is a person who you choose to tell about your mood disorder, who wants to be supportive in the good and the not-so-good times. Try and have more than one spotter, as someone may be away or have other commitments. But basically, the role of the spotter must be uh, laid down in advance and understood in advance. The spotter has to derive authority from the person as to what they will do if they notice a relapse. Have they the authority to arrange or advise on an increase in medication? And some people can manage rescue medication that way and get on track by taking a sleeping tablet for a while uh, and that can sort the problem out. Or have they author the authority to make a phone call to the doctor and arrange an early appointment? Or maybe the authority to do none of those things. In bipolar illness, a spotter can save enormous destruction by holding onto credit cards or passports or whatever. I have a patient whose best friend has his passport permanently, and it has really saved him. 
really, really big time from being, I believe, in jail in America when he went away on a high and was extracted from the plane before it took off. And he's eternally grateful uh, to his friend. And he has given him his passport permanently. So spotters should know the illness in general, the symptoms specific to the person, but always be willing to learn, always to revise and reflect on the spotting role and how it can be improved. Just one slide in advocacy and caring. We're aware of advocacy services. Advocacy services should be part of any modern mental health service. And advocacy services basically ensure that people who experience mental illness can speak out, can express their views, can make choices, and defend their rights. So advocates can maybe even go in and negotiate with the treating team, uh, with ward staff, to ensure that the person's views are respected and understood. And, and usually that's, that should be independent. But carers may actually also require advocacy to obtain fundamental information about the condition, such as diagnosis, knowledge of symptoms, causes of illness, treatments, prognosis, and longer-term management. Carers uh, exercise a, an invaluable role. And in one UK survey, they saved the UK government £119 billion in 2013. Now that could be, I'm, I'm just guessing here, maybe about an eighth of UK you know, GDP. Uh, so proper services could certainly increase this saving by giving carers a caring system that's on their side, thus allowing them a life on their own. So how can we advocate for carers and support them and beef up services uh, to assist them? So advocacy groups do acknowledge the need for family advocacy, particularly in dealing with other agencies such as social welfare. Um, I'm thinking of my, my patient group particularly, where home help hours are being cut back all the time. And, you know, the advocacy groups are needed to really challenge that and defend the entitlements that people seem to lose automatically when they come into hospital. We have to really try and press for the care package to be reconstructed when they're discharged. Okay, we want to talk about coming towards the end of the, the talk about caring for yourself while helping with the, the person with depression. So think of it, uh, this challenging time as a marathon. Mental illness is challenging in itself. It's fluctuating. It's surrounded by stigma and misunderstanding, and all these things can converge to increase the distress that carers feel. Speak up for yourself before these pent-up emotions make it hard to communicate sensitively, but be honest and don't judge your emotions. Set clear limits. I think that's a really key piece of advice on what you can do and what you can't do. Review regularly what you're doing with the person to avoid your resentment. Because sometimes if the person becomes utterly dependent on you, as human beings, we will expect that dependency to continue. And that may not be in the person's best interests. Have a life of your own. If you're depressed, loved one can't always participate. For example, if a spouse of a person with depression loves going out to the cinema and the person just can't go on the night, maybe have a backup plan. Rather than cancelling the whole event, at least go out with someone else so that you, you, you can have those enjoyments that you, you deserve and need. And seek support, maybe through a carer's group, maybe through the, the Aware Carers Support Network, through a friend, maybe spiritual advice may be helpful. Carer burnout is very significant. And emotions such as helplessness, frustration, anger, fear, guilt, and sadness, they're all normal. And I'm not saying they you know, qualify uh, by themselves in isolation as carer burnout. But added to cynicism, disengagement, and emotional exhaustion, even other things such as an intense fear of change or an inability to let go, and then you get burnout. And health professionals, unfortunately, get burnout very often too. So carer's health can be affected. Uh, carers can experience sleep difficulties, an inability to relax. They may drink too much. They may smoke too much. They may eat too much. And they may feel constantly tired. It's amazing if I ask carers of older people, particularly, particularly with dementia, the one problem they have, it's this constant sense of fatigue. That's what I hear all the time. And caregiver stress, if you like, is the earlier stage of this burnout. Now, we know from my experience with people with dementia, and this is a figure that's quoted and I think replicated internationally, 50% of carers of people with dementia will have depression themselves. It's a startling figure. How do you deal with it? Ask for help. Sometimes the carer is so immersed in the caring role, they feel so guilty about getting an outside help, or they feel so guilty about letting the person go to respite that they refuse flatly. And uh, this may be compounded by maybe the person themselves with the symptoms not wanting, wanting the help as well. But say yes to offers, share the control, spread the responsibility, try and give yourself a break. Can we not find 30 minutes in the day for ourselves? You know, minimum, where we pamper ourselves deliberately, consciously, uninterruptedly, where we have a bath, where we listen to music, 
where we put on a DVD or get out of the house, go for a walk, whatever you're into. Practice acceptance. Focus on the things that can be controlled and above all, share your feelings. Take good care of your health. If you have your own health difficulties, uh, and again, this would be something that I would often see that, that the spouse often gets sick uh, and maybe neglects visits to their GP, neglects exercise or, or meditation, uh, good diet. Support groups, local or online support groups can be very helpful as well. We have to be aware that family life uh, is often chaotic. So we do always, every time, no matter how old members of families are, adult children, younger kids, uh, and so on, we must accept that family life is often chaotic. It's a mix of unexpressed feelings where we hold the mirror to ourselves. We, do like what we, we dislike what we see, we project onto others what we don't like, and we constantly struggle. We struggle to be loved, to be understood, uh, to be in a different pecking order, to be the favoured sibling or whatever. But often underpinning it all, often underpinning all this mix, this maelstrom of emotions, there is a deep love, uh, often unexpressed or frustrated love. But that love nonetheless, that loyalty, allows us to embark on the caring role, the caring journey in the first place. It's as almost we feel ethically bound to do so. What services are out there to support you in that? AWARE services. St. Patrick's Mental Health Support and Information Line. I should say that AWARE offers the support line not only to people experiencing depression or looking for help, but also to family members. And the same with online uh, supports. And AWARE has a, a monthly carer support groups. And I know they're continually looking, I think I'm right, Annette, in saying this, to replenish and renew that group. The Carers Association, your general practitioner, again, very practical, problem-solving people. GPs will know the names of counsellors that they respect. They'll know, know the names of public health nurses, day centres. A whole host of services can be got through a GP surgery. Your district nurse, Samaritans in a crisis, organisations like Grow and Recovery, counselling ther uh, services, therapy services. Sometimes they can be private services or low-cost services. Services like the Irish Advocacy Network or Console, very specific to those who have been tragically bereaved uh, by suicide and accord those experiencing marital difficulties. So at the caregiver gym, I just want to give you an example of a problem that a care, caregiver may have and how it may be got around. So at the caregiver problem solving gym, that was the title of that slide. Step one, what exactly is the problem or, or, or the difficulty? Liz is unable to get up before noon most days. The goal is to get up, uh, Liz to get up before 10 a.m. five days a week. Step two, list all the possible solutions to that problem. Step three, what are the main advantages and disadvantages of each solution? Step four, choose the best solution. That might be Jane to wake Liz at 9 a.m. when she gets up for her shower. Family to leave Liz and not scold her if she doesn't get up. Mum to praise Liz if she does get up. Step five, plan exactly how to carry out the solution. Uh, for example, Liz to use an alarm clock, the date and time of the review. And step six, review progress and carrying out the homework. It may seem very obvious, but that's a, uh, a problem-solving or solution-focused therapy approach to some of the practical difficulties that may arise. And the research says um, that financial struggles, uh, in one UK survey of 800 carers, financial struggles actually can be practically one of the most difficult aspects of being a full-time caregiver particularly. Because 50% of people in this sample that were looked at were dependent on a fixed income from the state. Their caregiving role was so consuming that they weren't working, obviously. 15% of carers in this sample admitted drinking to excess. 45% wanted to run away. 60% were spending all their savings on on care, and 40% feared losing their home. And this was not just a sample of uh, people caring for older people. We know, though, that in terms of dementia care, uh, we get twice the rate of care or depression. Women certainly are more prone to depression than men. Men seem to be able to very pragmatically hire in the help. Often it's because, I think, us men are not terribly skilled at domestic things anyway. So, of course, we will outsource it and get it in. Uh, but men often have fewer emotional supports. So we can get the practical supports in, but the emotional supports may be a bit less. If you have sleep disturbance as a carer, and again, I'm thinking particularly of people who are looking after someone with dementia, uh, that can double the rate of depression that you may experience. And interestingly enough, and this will exactly, from this survey, back up my own experience, when someone goes into a nursing home, into long-term care, which is very often the 
the, 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 unfortunately, the outcome that does happen at the uh, at severe stage dementia. Often you would think that the, the depression in the, in the caregiver would disappear, and that's often not the case. It may, it may persist, very sadly. So types of research initiatives that are going on would be typically one, I just want to mention one, in Exeter University in the UK, pioneering a new uh, treatment for community caregivers where... They use a CBT package adapted to caregiver needs, and the treatment is delivered at home over an hour or two by psychological well-being practitioners. I love that phrase. I think that's a new title I want for myself. <laughs> and they've shown that there's good evidence for one particular type of therapy called mindfulness-based stress reduction programs. And the, there are uh, packages of, uh, of this type of approach of mindfulness in the US and in Australia, and it has been replicated that an eight-week program can be very helpful for caregivers. Just to give you some raw numbers, there's about 170,000 carers in Ireland, a very significant number, I think you'll agree. And of that number, about 38% are caring for people with mental health issues. Now, finally, I want to kind of come to some resources. I, I point out the, some websites just to the APA, the American Psychological Association website, I found to be particularly helpful. Uh, the Public Interest Directorate Reports <coughs> Caregiver section has very clear information. And a particularly clear website is the Canadian Mental Health Association, www.cmha.ca. I should say that this talk will be um, on the, the internet, hopefully, so you will be able to get those references again. A mindfulness book uh, that has been found to be very helpful and has been recommended by a lot of people is Mindfulness for Health by Vid Yamala Birch and Dr. Danny Penman by <coughs> Piakos Publishers. Uh, that's a, a book that has been uh, got a lot of plaudits. And information is available from AWARE, both in printed form and electronic form. The College of Psychiatry of Ireland has a special section for carers. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists has a lot of online resources, www.orcpsych.ac.uk. The organisation Mental Health Ireland has had a Caring for Carers programme for some time, and they continue to invest in that. And SHINE, the organisation that advocates for the rights and concerns of people with schizophrenia, has released a very useful policy document uh, realising family-friendly mental health services, which really is quite good and, and gives a lot of pointers, I think, to organisations like the HSE, those that have statutory responsibilities for service organisation and delivery. So in summary, emotional support from friends and family is vital in the journey of recovery from mental illness. Hopefully I've conveyed that sense to you. This is really, really crucial work that is being done. <coughs> Health services need to prioritise understanding the needs of families and carers and build alliances proactively with a range of concerned others. Caregiving is a valuable role, but one which needs to be exercised with balance, giving the person responsibility proportional to their level of recovery. Carers need to prioritise their own health needs, especially if the caregiving is protracted or prolonged. We need definitely much more protocols and care standards to support carers. We really only at the moment, I'm afraid, hands up and admit this, scratch the surface, as well as research to understand how health services can meet uh, their needs. In conclusion, family and caring networks are very diverse. They aren't static entities. They're composed of individuals who are growing, developing, changing, year on year, decade on decade. There is no such thing as a perfect family. And we have to, as mental health professionals, try and tap into the, the rules in which each family operates, and they may, may be all different. Many struggles for growth, development, independence are played out through the family and continue to be played out through the family even when kids are firmly in the adult age range. And at the end of the day, I think children, parents and siblings and friends have to accept each other as they are and the reality of the interposed illness without expecting them to change. Finally, finally, the ideal caregiver profile. Let me tell you who you are, those of you that are carers in this audience. You all have the patience of Job, the wisdom of Aristotle, the kindness of Joan of Arc. But a very nice quote from Marianne Radmacher. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. Or encourage the person to do the trying, respecting their resilience and capacity for change. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>